Good morning. I can't, begin, I can't think of a better way to begin our worship this morning than by baptizing seven new members of our church family. This is the Almond family. Dad, Kevin, Mom, Mary Ann, Sister Jessie, and Brother Joseph. Mary Ann has been a part of our family for a long time because she teaches in our kindergarten program. And now we're delighted to have all of them worshiping with us. Almonds, I'll ask all of you, what is your statement of faith? Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hear now the pledge of your family of faith. We will pray for you, and we will walk with you in the way of Jesus. So Kevin, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my brother, Kevin Amon, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptized with Christ and born and raised to walk in new life. Mary Ann, in, in, divine, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you now, my friend, and now my sister, Mary Ann Almond, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Baptized with Christ and raised to walk in newness of life. I will, I will. Joseph, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my brother, Joseph Amon, in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Jesse, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my sister, Jesse Amon, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Baptized with Christ and born to walk in brand new life. <laughs> this is my friend, Grayson. Coggins. Grayson is in the fourth grade at Lawrence Elementary. Her favorite subject is science. Grayson, what is your statement of faith? Hear now the pledge of your family of faith. So Grayson, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my sister, Grayson Coggins, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Buried with Christ and born and raised to walk in brand new life. This is my friend, Stella Black. Stella is in the second grade at Lawrence Elementary. Her favorite subject is science. Stella, what is your profession of faith? Hear now the pledge of your family of faith. We rejoice with you. We will walk with you. We will walk with you. 
So Stella, now in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my sister, Stella Black, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and born to walk in brand new life. This is my friend, Allie Martin. Allie is in the third grade at Lawrence Elementary, and Allie's favorite subject is math. Allie, what is your profession of faith? Hear now the pledge of your family of faith. We will pray for you, we will pray for you, and we will walk with you in the name of Jesus. So Allie, now, in obedience to the divine command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith in him, I baptize you, my friend, and now my sister, Allie Martin, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ and born and raised again to walk in brand new life. What a good day it's been already. Would you bow as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you <clears throat> for these sisters and brothers in Christ. Father, I pray that we would nurture them and help them as they continue in their walk and as they continue to learn how to be better followers of Christ. May we help as they grow. And now, Father, we offer you this time of worship. Would you take it and use it for your glory? In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful morning that you have blessed us with. What a special morning we have witnessed already as seven dear friends share their professions of faith with us. May we now set aside the distractions that seem to overwhelm us at times. Let us use this time to glorify and worship you. In your holy name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist. I especially welcome you, those of you who are visiting with us today. As we begin, just a couple of reminders to you. Um, our Lenten lunch that we will have this week will be Wednesday at First Methodist, just next door. It will be at noon, so if you are available to join us there, we would love for you to. Our recreation ministry has started pickleball, and they will now be gathering in the gym each Thursday from 5.30 until 7. So if that interests you and you want to be involved, then Andrew welcomes you, all ages, anybody, it doesn't matter, you do not have to be a youth to play pickleball. Um, they will meet in the gym this Thursday at 5.30. Again, it is so good to see you here this morning. If you will now take the pee pads found on the center of the aisle and begin to pass those. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Always. The more blue hosts we can get up here, the closer to heaven we get on a Sunday morning. So thank you for leading us. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 1 and going through verse 17. I'll be reading from the Common English translation of the New Testament. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave the world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully and to the end. 
Jesus and his disciples were sharing the, evil, the evening meal, and the devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hand, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and he took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter replied, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus responded, those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him, and that's why he said not every one of you is clean. And after he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. He said to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Just as I have done, you also must do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. This is the word of God read for the people of God this morning. Thanks be to God. We come to give back to you a portion of what you have so freely and generously given to us. Would you take these tithes and offerings and use them so that we may begin to see your kingdom come here on earth, just as it will be in heaven. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
choir. Thank you all. Dr. Thomas, thank you again. Some of you are aware already, have, have heard this news, that Don Burroughs passed away yesterday. If you will, keep Don's family in your prayers. Arrangements have not been made yet, but be on the lookout for those as they are figured out. As we pray for, for the Burroughs family this morning, of course, we also remember the situation in Ukraine, all those involved in, in the war over there and all that is going on. And so as we pray this morning, can we pray for, for the citizens who are caught up in all that is happening, for the soldiers, for the leaders, for all who are involved in that situation. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, how good it is to gather and to be in your house. Lord, we have celebrated this morning already as we have seen seven folks commit or recommit their lives to you and to being a part of your body here in this place. Lord, even as we celebrate this morning, we know that there is reason as well for mourning as part of that body, part of our fellowship here, has gone on to be with you. And so, Lord, we lift up the Burroughs family today, pray for your comfort in their grief, pray for your hands of blessing on them this day. And Lord, even as we gather today, we are reminded of the connection we have to each other and with all your creation. And so it's easy for our minds to move across oceans and thousands of miles to the situation in Ukraine. Father, we pray for your peace to prevail. Lord, we pray for those who are caught up in the fighting. God, the citizens who have nothing to do with what is going on but are there in the crosshairs. God, for the soldiers who are in the thick of fighting. Lord, those who are attempting to defend their homes and their loved ones. God, and those who are following orders that they may not understand and may not agree with, but have reason to feel that they have to. Lord, we pray for the leaders that cooler heads and common sense will prevail, that your peace will take root. Lord, in situations we do not understand, all we can do is lift them up to you. And so we pray your special blessing on those caught in the midst of war. Now, God, as we continue on in this place, may the words from my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. May you speak to us in this moment. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. What would you do, I wonder, if you knew that you couldn't fail? And I know that sounds like a middle school guidance counselor question. Uh, I know that's the kind of thing they ask you, you know, when they're trying to figure out what, what courses you need to take, what kind of study you need to go for. You know, if you could do anything, if you knew anything you did wouldn't fail, what would it be? Mine, at 12 years old, was that I would be a professional wrestling announcer little bit of insight into me as a 12-year-old, I already knew I wasn't going to get in the shape required to be up there in front of people doing it myself. Um, but yeah, I can talk about it. I think that sounds like something I could manage. What would you do if you knew you could not fail? What would you do if you knew that success was guaranteed? If you knew that anything you moved forward on would work out in your favor. I would guess that for a, lot, for a lot of us, that's a moot point. We know all too well that we can fail, and maybe we put a lot of time and effort and energy into making sure we only do things that we know we're not going to fail at. Maybe most of us live our lives planning around failure and preparing to get away from it. That is 
Dr. Thomas, why I do not have a music minor from PC. All I needed was to take theory Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 in the morning, and I could have gotten it. But sometimes we don't do things that we know we're not going to do well at, and I just wasn't about that 8 a.m. lifestyle at that point, and it wasn't worth it to me. Sometimes we set ourselves up to make sure we don't fail. But I think it's worth pondering. It's a question worth looking at. What would we do if we knew we couldn't fail? Because it's the state of mind that we find Jesus in as we come to this text this morning. It is the state of mind that John describes. And John begins this account of Jesus' last supper with His disciples of the night that He's going to be betrayed and arrested Um, And we realize pretty quickly, if we know the story, that something's wrong, something doesn't quite match up with what we've heard before. The bread and their cup are gone, and in their place is water and towels and feet and dirt. And we'll get back to all that in, in a minute, but I want you to go back to John 13. If you haven't, I want to take a second to look at Jesus's state of mind. Look at the way John describes Jesus' mindset at this meal. If he's worried about what comes next, he doesn't show it. If there's any uncertainty about what is to come, it isn't revealed. Um, And that's one of the characteristics if you read through John. Jesus is always, and therefore we as readers are always, certain that the next move is the right one. There is no uncertainty in Jesus' actions Jesus is always moving forward, always sure of his identity and his purpose. John says that in this moment, Jesus knew that his hour had come. Now, some of our students have been reading through the Gospel of John over the last couple of months, and I'm hoping that hour had come thing sparked something in them that resonates. Maybe it does with you. That's a callback. If you think back, if you remember all the way back to John 2, when Jesus is at a wedding. Hopefully this is ringing a bell. Jesus is at a wedding in Cana. They run out of wine. His mother comes up to him and asks him for help. And he says, what can I do? My hour has not yet come. My hour has not come at that point. His hour hadn't come then. Now the hour has come and Jesus knows it. The hour has come and Jesus is certain of it. He is aware of it. He knows as well that God has put all things in His power. That He has come from God and that He's returning to God. He knows in this moment with absolute certainty who He is and what He's about. And He knows that anything He does in this moment will not fail. He knows that whatever happens next is going to work out because he has the utmost certainty in who who he is and what he's going to do. And so I wonder, have you ever had that kind of confidence? And if you did, what would you do with it? That might be the wrong question because obviously Jesus' confidence comes from being the Son of God. It comes from being God in flesh, from being in that that inner relationship between the Trinity, it's part of who He is. So maybe the better question is, if we have confidence in who Jesus is, if we know who Jesus is, if, as our candidates for baptism spoke earlier, we know that Jesus Christ is Lord, what does that confidence look like? If we are certain in who Jesus is and what He is doing, how does that confidence get reflected? And I think the answer is in what we see in the text. We we get this description that Jesus stands up and the first thing He does is He removes His outer layer of clothing. He stands up and He starts taking things off. Now I promise there is not an illustration coming involving that this morning. But Jesus stands and He starts removing clothing. And I hope we catch what's going on there. I hope we understand what He's doing. He He takes down anything that sets him apart, anything that gives him any sort of status until he is wearing whatever a servant would wear. He is down to only the clothes that a servant would have in that moment. And he's able to do it, and this is important. He is able to do it because 
of that knowledge we've already talked about. It is that supreme confidence in who he was and what he's about that allows himself to take on the appearance of a servant to the disciples. He doesn't need the trappings of power and authority because he knows he has the power and authority. I hope you catch echoes in this of those words from Philippians 2. If you remember in Philippians 2, Paul is writing about the mindset of Christ and he says that Christ who was being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. There are folks who believe that this is the scene that prompts that statement. This idea of taking the very nature of the servant. Paul applies what Jesus does physically in this moment to what Jesus does in a broader sense by becoming human. He takes on the appearance of the servant. When he humbles himself by becoming human, he humbles himself now by presenting himself as a servant to his disciples. And not just any servant. A servant who washes feet. Now, foot washing is an ancient sign of hospitality. You get the idea behind it. People are walking all day. They're in the dirt. Their feet get dirty. So it's a sign both of hospitality from from a person entering a home or from the person welcoming you into your home and a kindness from the person coming into the home that feet get washed before you come too far in. When you enter someone's house, they provide the things you need to wash your feet. Did you catch that? Did you catch how I worded it? Because it was was intentional. The things you need to wash your feet. Most people just gave you a basin and some towels and let you handle that yourself because nobody wants to deal with somebody else's feet. Nobody wants to wash your feet. Nobody wants to have to interact with that. It was considered a very demeaning task. You could not make a Jewish servant do it. If, if you were a Jew, it, is, it was part of their laws, part of their understanding that good Jews could not expect from other Jews to wash someone's feet. Even if, you had a, even if someone owed you money and had sold themselves into slavery to try and pay off that debt, you still could not make them wash, their, wash your feet. There was a standard to what you could do. And that's why Peter freaks out. That's why Peter has this concern about what's going on. It's too far. It's too far to let this one he calls Lord, this one whose identity identity he recognizes, this person who he understands is so high above him, it is impossible for him to let him wash his feet. It's a bridge too far. He cannot let it happen. And that interaction with Peter shows us the first response Um, I think, to who Jesus is. This first response that that we are called to if we recognize who Jesus is and what He is doing. And it's the response that we've witnessed already today in our baptistry. It's the response of recognizing Him as Lord and letting Him wash us and make us clean. And maybe that's harder for us than we'd like to admit. Maybe that sounds really easy, but it's a little too hard for us because it requires a couple things from us. First, it requires us admitting that we need to be washed. It It requires us admitting that there's something in us that needs to be made clean. And we live in a society and a culture that more and more rejects this notion that there's anything wrong with us that needs to be fixed. We live in a world that more and more embraces this, no, everything's fine. You are good how you are that there's nothing to be made better. The testimony of Scripture, the testimony of this story is that everybody has something that needs to be made clean. That even as the disciples, as Jesus and Peter get into this, that even folks who have been washed have something that might still need to be made clean. So it's a continuing process of looking at ourselves and recognizing where we need Jesus to make us clean. Maybe it's hard because letting someone else be Lord is too much for us. Maybe we're sitting here and and that idea of not being able to fail makes a lot of sense because that's where we're going. As we're, we're moving along, everything's great, everything's going awesome for us, everything's working out the way we want it. 
And we're not going to mess things up. We're not going to put somebody else in control because we're good with how things are going on. And there's a warning about that here, I think. We can't wash ourselves and we can't, and we can't determine how we need to be washed. We cannot wash ourselves and we can't decide how we need to be washed. Peter wants to grab the rag away from Jesus. Peter wants to grab the rag, handle it himself, can do the washing on his own, but Jesus won't let him because we can't do the washing that God offers. We cannot do the kind of washing we need by ourselves. There is going to come a point, whether it shows up in this life or in the next, where being our own Lord isn't going to work, where trying to wash ourselves is going to prove to have been a mistake. There's going to come a point where the only option is to have let Jesus wash us. We have to let ourselves be washed. We have to let God take control. And we have to let God do it God's way. Because Peter's all over the map, isn't he? First he, first he doesn't want to be washed. Then he wants to you know, take the base and dump, dump it over my entire body. Let me, let me have the full bath here. He goes back and forth. If we say, like we've heard already, that Jesus Christ is Lord, we have to accept that that Lordship may not come the way we want it to. We have to accept that that Lordship may not look the way we would want it to. It may lead us down paths we don't want to walk. It may put us with people we're not comfortable being around. It may require us to serve in ways we wouldn't expect or ways we wouldn't choose. But unless we, have, unless we let ourselves be washed unless we let ourselves declare that Jesus is Lord, we'll have no part in what's coming next. There's a second response to it as well. In verse 12, after Jesus has finished washing the, washing the feet, and did you catch? How many disciples' feet does He wash? Did you catch it? All of them. All of them get washed. Judas is sitting there. And John tells us that Judas has already, the devil has already convinced Judas of what's to come. Judas has already made his decision. Judas is sitting there plotting the betrayal. And still, Jesus washes all of their feet. And then in verse 15, Jesus says something that we don't see anywhere else in the Gospels. In verse 15, it's the only example, it's the only record we have of Jesus saying to a group of people, either I have set for you or I am giving you an example. That word example only shows up right here in John 13, 15. It's the word, if you're a sewer, if any of you make dresses, you know that you know, dresses can be made out of different materials, they can be different colors, but when you sit down to make a dress, you have to follow a pattern. There is a pattern to the dress that has to be followed or what you sew, what you put together is not going to come out right. And that's the word that is used here. It's a word from sewing. It is the word, it is the word for following the pattern to make a dress. And Jesus says here, I just gave you a pattern. I just gave you an example to follow. There is only one way to truly follow me. And that is to take on the role of a servant. And that's the second response that we see in this text. That's the second response to recognizing who Jesus is. There's the response of salvation. And there's the response of service. Those are the things you cannot be a follower of Christ without. Those are the things that showcase a response to Jesus. If you cannot be washed and wash, if you cannot serve and be served then you haven't responded to the God who took on the role of a servant and poured Himself out, just like Jesus pours out water into the basin. And I think, to get back, I think that is why John leaves out the, water, the bread and the cup. That's why we don't see communion here. Because by the time John writes his gospel, people are aware of communion. They know the, they know the process. They participate in communion. But when we read about the Last Supper here in John's Gospel, when we read about the foot washing, we're supposed to be confronted by the fact 
that communion with Jesus is communion with the one who serves and invites us and demands of us that we serve in His name. That when we look at our table and we look at the front and it says, this do in remembrance of me. It isn't just telling us to take the wafer and to drink the cup. It is a call to take on the appearance of a servant, servant to take on the task of a servant to strip aside all the things that we lord over people and to follow the path of service. We cannot be followers of Jesus if we're not willing to be servants. We cannot say we're a part of Him if we're not following His example. Our salvation and our service have to go hand in hand because it is together that it is them together that present the fullness of how we're called to respond to the realization of who Jesus is and what He's about and what He's doing. This is, we've alluded to it already, you see maybe the purple all around. This is the first Sunday of Lent. We began our Lenten season with an Ash Wednesday service at the Episcopal Church now up there on Wednesday. I hope you'll consider being with us on Wednesdays moving forward if you're available, being at the Lenten lunches. Um, but it is the season of Lent, and you know that Lent is a time where sometimes folks give things up. Sometimes folks take on an attitude of fasting in preparation for the coming of Easter. I want to make a challenge to you this Lent. I want to make a challenge to you that is not based on giving things up, um, but it's a challenge to add something, and it's a challenge of servanthood. It is a challenge of service. Three things, actually. Three things that I want you to add to your plate here in this Lenten season. And some of you are thinking, oh, great, that's what I needed, more things I have to do. I think these are going to be easy for you. Three things I want you to try and add in this season of Lent. The first one is courtesy. Stop and take an assessment of how courteous you actually are. How well do you treat other people? You know, not, not in big ways, but just in the common everyday interactions with folks. When you see someone coming to the elevator, do you push the door open or the door closed? That's, the, that's how low, low we're going on this idea of courtesy. If you will commit yourself to being courteous for the next 40 days, to embracing courtesy for the next 40 days, you will find yourself flowing into service. Because how we greet each other and respond to each other, how we react to each other, that draws us in to an attitude of service. If we seek out being courteous to other people, opportunities for service will come to that. And the second thing flows from it. Embrace the idea of helpfulness over these next 40 days. Determining what the helpful thing to do is and doing it opens us up to grace because it makes us realize all the times we need help too. If you start to recognize how much other folks need help, you realize how much you need it as well. And that leads to my last challenge. For the next 40 days, for this season of Lent, ask for help when you need it. Commit yourself to asking for help when you need it. Because service comes from letting ourselves be served. Service is, a, service is a reaction to how we can be served. And if you won't accept a service from other people, you're going to be resistant to it when it comes from God. If you're not willing to let other people serve you, you're going to reject the idea of a God that is offering to serve you. And what we see in this text is that it is in the attitude of a servant that Jesus comes and offers salvation. So this morning we've heard this story of water and rags and feet and dirt about what we have to do if we know who it is we follow, about what, who we are called to be if we have the confidence that nothing that Christ can do can fail. So if we know that Jesus' love and power are never going to fail, that any task He sets Himself to is going to be successful, what will we do with that confidence? What will we do with that knowledge? How will we respond to the reality of who He is 
and what's he's, what he's doing. Let's pray about that. Father, in the example of the pool in front of us, we're reminded of the call that you make to let ourselves be washed, to recognize where we need to be made clean and know that you're the only one who can do it. And God, the challenge that comes beyond that to respond to your example of service by committing ourselves to being servants of others. And so, Lord, my prayer for all of us is that we might recognize where we need those responses in our lives. Lord, that we might recognize the places in us that still need to be cleaned and the places we are failing to respond as servants to your world. God, challenge us, shine a light on us, that we can act with the confidence of who you are and what it is you're doing. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. This morning we'll give opportunity to respond. I'll be down front as as always. We have someone, if there is a response that you wish to do publicly, perhaps you have heard this morning, the call to, be, to accept the washing, to be made clean. Perhaps you've seen folks come and be baptized this morning and you recognize that's where I am and that's what I need. And we would welcome you in profession of Jesus as Lord this morning. Maybe you are looking for a church home. Maybe you are looking for a place to serve and to be served, to be moved forward towards the path that Jesus calls all of us. We would welcome you this morning. I'll be down front. My prayer for all of us is that whether it's here publicly, whether it's later on our own, that we will listen, we'll respond to where God is leading us today. a seat for just one second for me. Brady, you can come up here. Daniel, you can come up too if that would make it easier. This is Brady Share. Most of you know Brady and know 
mom, Daniel, and Allison, or not mom, Daniel, I'm sorry, but parents, Daniel and Allison, and brother George, and of course, grandparents, and everyone involved. Brady comes down this morning to make his profession of faith to say that he wants to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of his life and to be a part of this church family and be baptized. So we are excited for Brady. We're excited for the family. And if you would support that decision and welcome him into this family of faith, would you let it be known with an amen? Amen. 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 And Brady, that was pretty good. I think that was, a, that was a pretty solid response. And that lets you know how much we love you and how much, how excited we are for you. Allison, George, if y'all want to come on down front, I'm going to ask Brady to be up here because I know that folks will want to welcome him this morning. And so, as we prepare to go, would you stand and receive these words of benediction? As we go from this place, may we go in the knowledge of who Christ is and what He is doing. May we go with the willingness to be served and to serve. May we be open to being washed. May we look for the ways we can be ones who wash others. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.